greedy businesses they're raising the prices but it's interesting that yeah they are raising the prices but they haven't raised their prices as high as their expenses have gone up you've been talking a lot lately about saving and how it's losing in this economy yeah so if people aren't saving and they're not supposed to what should they be doing well it depends what you mean by saving right i mean if you're talking about just living below your means, you have to live below your means. But I've moved a lot of my money outside of the bank because if you keep your money in the bank, you keep all of your savings in the bank, you're guaranteed to lose. Uh, 2021 inflation is somewhere in the range of 5 to 7% is what we saw in 2021, depending on which reports you look at. And these are just the reported numbers. The actual numbers are higher than that. Like if you wanted to buy a, a home in 2021, you saw 20% inflation between 2020 wow. and 2021. If you wanted to rent a new home in 2021, you saw 12, 13, 14% inflation. So, you know, these averages only show you certain numbers. And when the Fed talks about what is inflation, they take massaged numbers. They don't, they take out your food costs, they take out your energy costs because obviously nobody has to pay for higher food prices and nobody has to pay for <laughs> higher energy prices, right? But so, you have to take all the inflation numbers that you get with kind of a grain of salt. And so let's just assume now inflation is 5%. You keep your money in the bank, you cash in the bank, what are you getting? 0.01%, maybe 0.1%. Maybe if you move it to a high interest account, you're getting half a percent. Well, if you're getting half a percent, and I know most people are not getting half a percent because I wasn't in my traditional bank and my uh, high interest, I was getting something around there. But um, if you're getting whatever, half a percent and int inflation is five, well, you're losing a lot of money. I mean, you're, you're losing a lot of value, right? The dollars you have stay there. If you have $100 in the bank, it stays $100. But the buying power of $100 when you're in a high inflationary environment doesn't just stay the same, right? You, you lose buying power. So I, have, I did a couple of things to protect kind of my money. Um, I still have my bank accounts, still have some money there, my operating capital. But I moved a big chunk into uh, stable coins, uh, cryptocurrency like I talked about, and these are paying me eight to nine percent a year in interest. So one stable coin, one US dollar. They, they're a stable coin. There's different kinds, but to keep it simple, uh, there are some stable coins that are pegged to the value of the US dollar. So one stable coin is one US dollar. So if I take a hundred dollars, buy a hundred stable coins, and I move these stable coins into an interest-bearing account, I'm going to get eight to nine percent interest on my stable coins, and then I can cash. Uh, cash out of it and move it back to my bank account or wherever I want. I can move it anywhere, uh, anytime I want. So now instead of earning 0.01%, I'm earning 8 or 9%, which is at least keeping up with and beating inflation a little bit. So this is money that I'm waiting to be invested, right? Like I have my emergency fund. This is cash that's just waiting. That's not doing anything. This is just money that uh, if something bad happens, I can dip into this. But then I have money that I want to invest. And... If I just keep it in cash, well, it's buying power gets eroded away. So one of the things that stable funds, uh, stable coins, I've also moved some money to physical gold, uh, like I've talked about before, because gold is another inflationary hedge. It, it's a store of value. It takes time, effort, and labor to mine an ounce of gold, and that's represented through the physical gold. So, uh, you know, if, if you start to see more inflation, then people move their money out of cash into physical gold. The whole idea being... Right. There's there's two kind of ideas of bad scenarios. Bad scenario one is asset prices go down. People call this a market crash. Bad scenario two is dollar crash. The value of the dollar goes down. So market crashes is what everyone's familiar with. Real estate stock prices go down. You take cash and you go out and buy this. If you see a market crash like this, if you have cash, you are in a winning situation because now you can use your cash to buy assets at a discounted price. But what most people are not familiar with is what happens if you see some sort of dollar crash or real devaluation of the dollar. So, you know, if you see a lot of inflation, well, what does that mean? It means you're inflating the monetary supply, which causes the value of the dollar to go down. Now, if you see a lot of deflation of, uh, of the value of the dollar, if you see a lot of, well, it's not deflation, it's if you see a lot of inflation, so the value of the dollar goes down, but what happens then? Well, if your value of your dollar goes down, this can make the price of assets actually go up because now you need more dollars to buy stocks. You need more dollars to buy real estate just because relative to the value of the dollar, these have gone higher. So 
even though like a company might not be producing more value, might not be producing more profit relative to the dollar, stock prices might go up, real estate prices might go up. So you see that with inflation, right? we saw that happen all throughout 2021. Even if companies weren't making more money, even in 2020, between 2020 and 2021, even if companies weren't making more money, you saw their stock prices rise like crazy. Why? Inflation, right? There's more dollars out there. The dollars flow into the assets. People get free money or people get more dollars and then they take it and they go spend it at companies. So more money flows to the top. Anytime you see more inflation, it creates a bigger wealth gap between the rich and the poor because what, what's happening? The middle class and the poor are saving dollars. And as you see more inflation, your dollars can't buy you as many groceries. They can't buy you as nice of a home. They can't buy you as much stuff. But also, it becomes harder for you to invest in assets. Stocks are more expensive. Real estate is more expensive. And so even cryptocurrency, right? We saw the boom in Bitcoin and crypto prices in 2021. So as you see inflation, the prices of assets go up um, because you see more dollars out there. And so if you see the value of the dollar go down, you could see stocks, real estate go up. So you don't actually see a crash in these assets, but you could see a crash in the dollar, which would make these assets go up even more. So how do you protect against that? Again, like I've been saying, right? I made videos about this. I own gold um, and then I own Bitcoin, I own stable coins. Now, Bitcoin is 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 kind of risky in the sense that you see a lot of volatility with it. It goes up and down like crazy. You can see crashes in Bitcoin very mm -hmm. fast. You can see big booms in it. And so if you don't understand it and you're not willing to appetite that volatility, then maybe that's not for you. Now, gold is kind of even more stable. You didn't see a huge run up in gold prices in twenty between 2010 and 2020 like you did in crypto. But gold is kind of, it's been around for centuries. People know gold. It's always going to be around. And it's, it's one of those things where it'll always have some sort of value. Um, and so, you know, if it's just kind of like an inflationary hedge in that sense. It's protection. It's insurance. It's my insurance policy. I own physical gold. I, it doesn't earn me any return. It just sits there. My stable coins also have their own fair share of risk because I put this money in an interest-bearing account. But the interest-bearing account is not a bank. So it's not FDIC insured. So I could lose all my money. I understand that. Um, but, you know, I... I, I do it again. I take my risks. I look at the interest bearing account. I do my research on them. I want to make sure who they're lending money out to, right? With a bank, you deposit your money in the bank. You don't know who the bank is lending the money out to when you deposit your money. You just assume that they're going to make smart decisions, but they really don't have to because they have FDIC, they're insured. So that's why nobody shops around for banks because no one cares, right? I mean, the reason why no one cares is because you have FDIC. With this, it's a little bit different because you don't have the FDIC protection, so you can't treat it like you do your traditional bank. You need to do your research, look for places, you know, look for the right places to in deposit it. And then you also have the stable coin issue where if you invest your money into a bad stable coin because there's multiple stable coins where the stable coin goes under, well, now you're going to be the one paying the price. So again, you got to do your own research. You have some stable coins like the one created by Gemini, which are regulated. So, you know, there's different things you can do. You have some stable coins like like Tether. It's another stable coin. Tether was investigated because there was claims that they didn't own enough dollars relative to the amount of stable coins that they had issued. So, you know, another risk. So you got to make sure you're doing the, your due diligence on this and it has its own fair share of risk. But if you're willing to do that due diligence, well, then you can say some of the upside, right? I moved a big chunk of cash out of the bank into these stable coins because now I'm actually earning some interest. And this is money that's just waiting to be invested, whether it's in real estate, whether it's in stocks, whether it's in a startup opportunity, whether it's in a cryptocurrency. I mean, this, this is just this money that I have waited to waiting to be invested right now. I think that's one of the biggest things people are afraid of when it comes to this word investing, right? Because when you invest, there is that big risk because the markets are never guaranteed to go up. You're never guaranteed to make any money when you invest. Right. But for the majority of people, they see saving as a way to kind of mitigate that risk, right? Yeah. They can take that cash, put it in a savings account, and at least they know it's there and it's protected by the government. Yeah, and, and, and you're 100% right. I mean, your savings, you can see it and you understand it. I, I put $1,000 in my bank. I know that that $1,000 is there. If the bank goes under, I got FDIC, I'm going to get my $1,000 back. I mean, it, it's, it's safe. But you also have the risk of, okay, if I keep my cash in the bank and I don't invest it, well, then what? Well, then this $1,000 is going to stay $1,000, but if I invested it, maybe this $1,000 returned $2,000. 
or you have the risk of you put this thousand dollars in the bank it doesn't do anything but then the value of the dollar goes down you see more inflation then what well now your thousand dollars can only buy you what eight hundred dollars could before right so so when you save your money in the bank you're guaranteed to lose mm. guaranteed guaranteed to lose because your bank is not going to give you enough interest to cover inflation so saving your money in the bank while it is safer is a guaranteed loss and if you're okay losing that value sure but i, I you know you gotta you gotta make the decision for yourself because when you save your money in the bank it's a guaranteed loss which is why you know people are are, are starting to get worried starting to looking for alternatives and that's where you know the things that i've been talking about you have to get financially educated because the reality is man, this inflation isn't just going to go away. The prices of things are not just suddenly going to drop. Sure, you might see the prices of some things go down because companies overproduced in 2021 and 20, or 2022 rather, they're overproducing. And so they made all these orders, demand goes down, they have a bigger supply. You can see the price of some things drop, but the cost to produce these products is not going to just suddenly go away. If a company, manufacturing company, used to pay employees, let's just say $9 an hour, and they pay them $18 an hour, they're not just going to suddenly take these wages and push it back down to $9 an hour. They're going to be paying $18 an hour. And if they're paying 50% more for the raw materials, for the, whatever they're getting overseas, they're paying 50% more for their, their products, whether it's cotton or metals or whatever they're paying. They're paying a lot more to get the supplies to build their products Unless they could get a massive break on this price, what's, how are they going to increase their margins? And so what we've been seeing happen is you have two inflation indexes. You have one for the consumer side, and then you have some for the producer side. The consumer side, everyone talks about CPI. That's the kind of what the media talks about. Now, CPI, <clears throat> consumer price index, again, this, this isn't a true measure of inflation. This looks at certain data points and says that this is the average inflation that some people see, but the reality is it doesn't really give you a very accurate depiction because, you know, CPI says 6% inflation. Well, if, if your um, rent went up 15%, what is 6% to you? If, if your milk that you want to buy is 20% more expensive, it doesn't give an accurate report for everyone. But CPI is... is on average of what some people are paying for certain things higher. But then you also have the inflation that you see on the producer side. So CPI, again, is on the consumer side. Then you have uh, producer inflation numbers. These producer inflation numbers have been higher than CPI. What does that mean? You have companies that are producing products that are also seeing inflation, right? They have to pay more money to get their raw goods. They have to pay more money to produce their products. But they haven't raised prices as much as their costs have gone up. Now, some of the reason why companies hadn't raised prices all the way is because the Fed keeps telling them not to. It's transitory, inflation is going to go away. And so companies don't want to raise prices because they don't want to lose the trust of their consumer. They don't want to lose customers. And so they're, they've been eating up that cost. But there's only so long that they can do that for, right? I mean, you saw dollar stores start to raise the price of their products above a dollar for the first time in 2021, right? That, that was a brand new. Mm hmm they don't want to do that, but they had no other option. And we're starting to see more and more companies starting to hit a point where they're realizing that, holy crap, this inflation might not be temporary. We might not see the price of our products, our raw materials go down. And so they're being forced to now raise their prices. And so in 2021 and into 2022, what we saw was that the producer inflation is higher than the consumer inflation. Mm -hmm. but what does that mean? That means these companies are making less margins they have smaller profit margins because their their costs have gone up more than what they're selling it for and so people will say greedy businesses they're raising the prices but it's interesting that yeah they are raising the prices but they haven't raised their prices as high as their expenses have gone up and so there's a chance that we could see the prices of products continuing to go up because companies might say okay we were able to balance out some of these lower margins because we had such high demand People were spending money like crazy in 2021. And eventually they might say, okay, well, we, we need higher margins. We can't sustain these lower margins forever. So they might have to raise their prices. And so the whole idea of, you know, prices are suddenly going to drop, which is what the Fed keeps saying. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, 
be honest. Be, be honest with the American people. The Fed is the enemy of the American people. They're lying. They keep saying that it's going to go away. What does inflation as transitory mean? It's been a year <laughs> plus, more than a year of transitoriness right now. How, how transitory is transitory? And so it's like you just keep lying and saying the same old like thing again and again and again, hoping that people will believe it. But like, I mean, let, let's really analyze this. What, what does that mean? I mean, the best case scenario at this point is really that inflation cools down. Inflation cools down means that we go from high inflation to regular inflation, like what the Fed has been talking about, 2% inflation or whatever the numbers were. The reason why they didn't make take any action in 2021 was because they said that they had this target of 2% inflation that they wanted to hit. Well, month after month after month, we saw higher than 2% inflation, but they didn't do anything about it because they just kept saying we want to see our inflation targets, we want to hit our economic targets. So it's like they just keep changing the narrative. We want to see 2% inflation so we can uh, grow our economy. We saw like in October of 2021, we saw it was like 6.2 or 6.4% annualized inflation, 6.2%, I think, 6.2% annualized inflation. And then they change it and they say, well, we want to see 2% inflation, but more we want to see economic growth. So they just keep changing the the narrative that they have. And so it's like, okay, you have to really start thinking about how do you protect yourself? Because the Fed hurts the average American person. The average person who's not financially educated now doesn't see wage increases enough to cover these higher expenses. And the Fed looks at, you know, they don't look at CPI, they look at massaged numbers. That they, they Actually, this was a, a huge debate that happened in 2021. I made a video on this. Michael Burry called out the Fed, said they're liars, because what they said was in their report, they don't look at these inflation numbers as they reported. They take the inflation numbers and then they remove the outliers. So they remove the top 34% and they remove the bottom 21%. So like if I take this chart right here and I plot a whole bunch of inflation numbers, so some are really high, some are really low, and then I remove the top 34% and then I remove the top 21%. So now more than 50% of the inflation numbers are outliers. What does this leave you with if, if, if this is what you have left? Well, it's a smoother inflation line when in actuality you're seeing inflation more like this or you saw more inflation like that in 2021 so the goal is okay inflation cools down let's say inflation cools down to two percent what does that mean well then that means the prices of, of goods are probably going to continue rising not by the the same rate that we saw in 2021 but by a slower rate so that's kind of like what people have started to come to terms with is yeah the price of some goods might come down but the reality is prices of things are probably not going to go back to what they were in 2018 or 2019 or early 2020. Uh, they're, they're probably going to stay high. And, and that, that is, I mean, it's, it's becoming more and more of a reality because how long can you say that inflation is transitory for? 20 years? I mean, the gold was, the dollar was taken off the gold standard temporarily in 1971. And last I checked, we're still not on the gold standard. So, I mean, I mean, you could say it's temporary for, I guess, your whole life. But, I mean, this, it's just, that's the situation that we're in. So, what you're saying is either the Fed doesn't know what they're talking about or they're lying to you. We're going to jump back into the video in just a second. But if you want to learn more about investing your money in the stock market, our team put together an amazing guide on how to start investing your money in the stock market that you can read for free when you sign up for our daily newsletter. This free guide will walk you through what is stock market investing, how you can get started with stock market investing, and different stock market investing strategies. So whether you're a brand new stock market investor or you're an experienced stock market investor, this free guide can help you take your stock market investing to the next level. And again, this is for stock market investors. This is not made for people who want to be stock market traders. This is for people who want to actually be investing their money for the long term. So if you want to read our free stock market investing guide and start getting a daily newsletter, I'll put the link to where you can download our free stock market investing guide in the description below. I think they know what they're talking about. You know, and I think they're smart people. So what would they have to gain from lying to American, to Americans? Well, it's, it's interesting. What, what is the Fed's goal? The Fed is in charge of 
controlling the monetary supply. And they work with presidential administrations. Uh, and so, okay, let's, let's put this in perspective. No president, no administration wants to see a crash, not, wants to see an economic slowdown on their watch. And so let's assume that the Fed came out and said, America, we were wrong. Inflation was not transitory. We caused inflation. So we're going to do the right thing. And we are going to try to fight inflation to help the American people. What's going to happen? Stock market will crash. Real estate market will crash. Because what does it mean to fight inflation? You got to contract the monetary supply, right? Inflation is inflating the monetary supply, increasing the monetary supply. So contracting the monetary supply would mean taking dollars out of the system, which would mean raising interest rates, maybe significantly. If you do that, you're going to see market crash. You, you, you're going to see markets come down because it's going to be more expensive to buy a home. It's going to be more expensive to buy a stock. It's going to be more expensive to do a lot of things. Businesses are going to have a harder time borrowing money, and that will cause an economic slowdown. They don't want to see that happen. No, no administration wants to see that happen on their, their watch because they don't have the guts to do what's really good for the economy long term. See, crashes are a refresh. It's a way to get rid of bad assets. It's a way to get rid of toxic assets. It's a way to get rid of bad investments. But, you know, we saw in 2008 the whole idea of too big to fail. I mean, things are getting bigger and bigger. And this too big to fail idea is becoming even bigger. But you have to let the bad assets fail. If you don't, then the bad assets keep getting bigger and bigger. And so, you know, what, what are they trying to do? Well, one, they don't want to look bad. They, they don't want to trigger a slowdown. That's why it was so hard for the Fed to start tapering the asset purchases. They were buying $150 billion worth of assets every single month from 2020 into 2021. In the early part of 2020, they were actually buying more, but then they tapered it down to $150 billion. And they did that through the to the end of 2021, which is when they finally started tapering. Why did it take so long? They were worried about a taper tantrum. A taper tantrum is when you see a mini stock market crash because they pull the money printer. They stop pouring money into the markets. If they stop pouring money into the markets, well, that causes asset prices to go down. Now, we were fortunate that we didn't see the sort of tap, taper tantrum because I think people expected that it was going to happen. Um, they had talked about it for so long, but that's why they didn't do it. They said it again and again and again. The reason why we can't stop these asset purchases is because we're worried about a taper tantrum. We don't want to see that happen. So who are they looking out for? The investors. They're looking out for the people who are wealthy which is why, again, you need to be financially educated. The next issue is born on a broader economic level. The United States government has $29 trillion with the national debt. They can't afford it. So how do you pay back debt that you can't afford? Well, you could increase your income. And in that case, that would mean the government has to raise taxes. Now, they're, they're working on that, but they can't, they're not raising taxes to the level that, that uh, President Biden would have liked, which he originally proposed. Uh, but both parties kind of agreed that they were, those are too high and it would really hurt the economy by raising taxes that much. And so, you, but, but you're never going to be able to raise taxes enough to cover government spending. Government spending keeps increasing. Taxes don't increase fast enough. And so you have now left this national deficit, this national debt, which is very high. So how do you pay that back? Well, if you can't do it through raising money, through taxes, then you can inflate it away. And that's what they're trying to do. So the way that you pay it back now is by paying it back with cheaper dollars, by paying it back with these dollars, which now are worth less. Because now if I owe, let's just assume, a million dollars on a fixed rate mortgage today, and then inflation happens, well, now my debt isn't as expensive because the money that I have to pay doesn't feel as painful because the value of each dollar has gone down. Maybe I'm earning more money. Maybe my assets are worth more. So that's what the government's trying to do. As you create more inflation, the value of $29 trillion starts to go down because now they can pay back this money with cheaper dollars. So, you know, it, it's it's a kind of a sticky situation where they're trying to play, I call it chicken. They're trying to increase the GDP, the economy, but the way they're trying to do that is by spending more. Our debt has already grown way faster than a GDP. And so it's like this game of chicken. They're like, okay, our economy is not growing fast enough, so what do we do? Well, let's spend more, cheaper dollars, more inflation to hopefully grow our GDP. But what's happening is 
our debt's growing way faster than our economy. And I mean, just look at it from a consumer standpoint. If you go and you start spending money at the mall and you spend money you don't have, what's going to happen? Your, your uh, credit card bill is going to start to rise. As your credit card bill starts to rise and you can't afford it, well, now your minimum payments start to rise. So what can you do? Well, you can earn more money, which is what you're supposed to do, which you should do, to start paying it off. Or in this case, they just keep spending more money, hoping that this extra spending is going to help pay it down. So it's, it's a tricky situation where they're, they're trying to play chicken and they're hoping that it will work out. And hopefully it does for the sake of the dollar and the economy. But if it doesn't work out, then they ha kind of have this range of scenarios from good to bad. And the good isn't even that good. It's that inflation just cools down instead of it goes away. And, and, and it doesn't look like product prices are just going to suddenly drop. <laughs> the only way that they could drop is if you see a glut of supply which could happen in some some uh, areas where you see just excess supply of stuff and they just want to get rid of it off of their books and so they're going to sell it at a huge discount, which we might see that happen with some things, but in terms of the actual cost of producing, the cost of producing is not going down. And until we see the cost of producing go down, we're not going to see the price of products go down. And even then, if a company can produce a product for lower cost, they still need incentive to sell their product for less because if people are still buying their products at a higher price, even though their cost is down, why would they reduce their price? Because people are still paying higher prices. So that's the situation. And then that's where it's like, okay, what do you do? Well, for me, it's, <laughs> I want to earn some interest on my money because if my money is in the bank earning nothing, I'm losing. Now I want to ask you for the U S government, is there a time that they can get too far into debt? I mean, can the U S government actually fail because they've taken on too much debt or, or who, who actually pays for this? Is it going to be the U S government or is it going to be the American people? Well, the government gets their money from the people. The government is not a for-profit entity. They get their money from people through taxes. And so they have two ways of, of paying their expenses. Either they raise taxes or they print the money. When they raise taxes, you know exactly who's paying for it. If they levy a tax on the rich, uh, a 2% tax on the rich, well, then that money is coming directly from the rich. You, you, you know who's paying for it, right? You can see it from the tax bill. The rich is paying for it. On the alternative, if they don't raise taxes and they continue spending, which is what they always do as well, even if they don't raise taxes, then who pays for it? Then it's the average person. Then it's a disingenuous way of, of taxing the American people because then it's it's a way of, it's, it's they're, they're taxing you without your approval, without legislation, and you're, you're paying the tax without even knowing it, without even realizing it, because now it's just a higher price of goods. You, you go buy mm. groceries, it's more expensive. So your question is, can we have too much debt? Now, let me just be honest here. This has been going on for decades, where people have been talking about a national debt crisis. This isn't anything new. Uh, I read Warren Buffett's book, Snowball, and he talks about when he was like a teenager, just like starting to get started into his financial journey, there was a huge cry of the American people talking about how the United States is going to default. We, are, we are have a national debt crisis. And we're talking about, I think it was like a billion dollars with the national debt. So nowhere <laughs> near where we are now. And even then, people were talking about this national debt crisis. Well, that didn't go away. It's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where now we're at 29 trillion. And so that's the argument that a lot of people have. What's the big deal? Nothing bad has happened before. We printed in 2008. We got ourselves out of the economy. We didn't see massive inflation, even though we did see inflation. It's just that people don't realize that if we didn't print all that money, the prices of goods wouldn't have been as high as they were after 2008. We printed after 2001, same thing. Nothing bad happened. Sure, maybe we saw some inflation, but at the expense of what? When we were able to save our economy. Well, if you are a heroin addict and you keep shooting yourself up with heroin and then you try to get off and then you get withdrawal symptoms and you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. So then you start shooting yourself up more and then, and then you start taking bigger doses. You start, you know, you start double dosing and, and no problem. You're okay. So you say, well, I've raised how much drugs I'm taking. Nothing bad has happened. So let me take more and maybe nothing happens again. So you take more, but eventually, right? I mean, it's like, it's like you, you, everyone has a tipping point. Eventually you hit too much. Where is that too much? I don't know. There's no way to, to know that. And so that's, that's exactly what the government is doing. It's, it's 
again and again and again we've printed and we printed and printed and nothing bad has happened but eventually you will hit a tipping point and i don't know when that tipping point is i don't know if it's in 12 months or 12 years or you know whatever it is I, there's, there's no way to know and so it's just when is that tipping point going to be and so what we know is that drugs are bad they can hurt you the more drugs you take the more bad that can happen to you if you keep increasing your dose something bad can happen uh, you know can you can you just keep doing that forever maybe you can just kind of get lucky with it and so it's like but with the united states government it's how long can you keep injecting yourself with this drug with this free money and that's the question and nobody knows the answer but it's now it's i understand the risks so I want to protect myself because I, I don't like to be in the business of trying to predict the future. I know some people like to try to do that. I, I, have, I have no way of knowing that. I mean, if I try to predict, I'm going to be wrong. So I don't like to do that. Instead, what I like to do is I invest my money in places where I protect myself no matter what. I invest in real estate, stocks, businesses, crypto, and gold because I don't know what's going to happen. I invest in real estate for cash flow. I invest in stocks because I believe in the American economy. I believe we're the strongest economy in the world. I, I invest in businesses because I love working with entrepreneurs. Highly risky. Most startups are going to fail, but I love investing in businesses for that very reason because I like working with the entrepreneurs. I invest in crypto because I believe it's the people's movement of money. And I have a money in stable coins as a way of earning interest. And then I invest in physical commodities like gold because it's a store of value. So my gold is my insurance. My stable coins are earning me some interest. My Bitcoin is the future of, of money is where I'm investing. My, my startups are a way for me to invest in innovation because I love working with entrepreneurs. I love investing for the future. My stocks are giving me exposure to the future of the American economy. And my real estate is giving me cash flow. I'm investing in areas where people want to be. It's a tangible asset. And in case everything goes wrong, that's where I have my physical gold, right? So it's like, I don't know what's going to happen. I talk about everything that could happen. I talk about everything that's going on, but I don't know. And I, and I don't like to be in the game of predicting because most people who predict are going to be wrong and, and that's where you, you know it's just you got to be educated enough where now you can make your smart decisions with your money based off of what you think is going to happen so that, that's kind of what it is this is crazy to me because my entire life growing up i was taught from day one you've got to save you've got to save every penny you earn you've got to save and that's how you get, get wealthy so did financial education like this just kind of come out of the blue? What, did, <laughs> what do we know now that our parents didn't know? Why didn't our parents well, know about investing and, and diversifying? Where did this come from? Yeah, I mean, I grew up the same way. I, I was grew up being told uh, that saving is how you become wealthy. I grew up in a traditional Indian house. And, you know, same thing as a save heavy culture. Because that's the safe way. It's how you build wealth. You know, you, you can see your dollars growing. The more dollars you have, the wealthier you are. But it's a different environment now. In the 80s, if you wanted to put your money in the bank, you put your money in the savings account, you would get 10% a year on your savings. Wow. You could put your money in the bank, protect it, and earn 10%. You don't get anything near that in a bank right now. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's not even comparable. And so that when, you, when you have those type of interest rates, you can just put your money in the bank and see your money grow. You're okay because that's how the economy was but our economy is not like that anymore we're in a very different stage of our economy in our parents time when they were growing up our economy our gdp was growing by five to eight nine ten percent a year so if you see this type of economic growth you put your money into value stocks your stable companies in the stock market and you can see very big returns safely Stably, now our GDP project, pro projections are like we're hoping, hoping to grow by 2% a year. And the way that we're getting to this 2% growth a year is through cheap debt and money printing. Like it's, it's like we're, we're fighting hard to get this 2% growth a year when before we were smaller, we were able to grow much bigger, much easier. So it's a very different economic environment. And if you keep following the old money rules in this economy, it's a guaranteed route to broke. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. You know, the Indian culture is a save-heavy culture. And, and man, like, if, if you're just saving all of your money, you're, the value of your dollars are being eroded. And, you know, if you want to trust the Fed and the government, fine. But just 
just be aware of the alternatives. Like you don't gotta trust me. Just just be aware. That way you can protect yourself. Because if the value of your dollars go down, you need to know what to do. That way you can really focus on building that wealth. And and, and the reality is, you know, it's 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 a change. And and nobody wants nobody likes change. Nobody nobody is easy to adapt to change. Uh, I uh I was at the bank. I was actually wiring another big chunk of cash into my stable coins, and the banker was just like, I don't, I don't think we get along very well because she knows I don't like to keep all my money in the bank, and she likes to kind of sell me things that I don't want. And every time she tries to sell me these products, I I never want them. But, you know, I'm like, she's like, oh, uh, are you sure this is not a scam? Because as she started happening, the, the same thing happened years ago because I used to move a, a lot of, I, used, I operate with a traditional bank, and then um, I started working with a high interest bank. So this is years ago, and a high interest online bank. They they would pay like uh, two point five percent, maybe even three percent a year in interest, while a traditional bank was paying like point one, right? So it's like it's night and day difference. So first thing I did was I moved a big, big, big chunk of my cash into these online banks. And I remember I, it was the same banker, same question. She's like, "Oh, uh, are you sure this is not a scam that you that you you know getting this?" I'm like, "Well, they're." A bank, they're they're FDIC insured. Oh, but you, but you can't access your money. I mean, it's on the internet. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, it's like they, they have like such an old mindset, or either that, or they're just trying to like scare you into not doing this. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm willing to take that risk. She's like, but that's a lot of money you're moving. And I'm like, oh, it's okay. We'll figure it out later. <laughs> you know, it's like, what am I supposed to do? Like, just just do this, please. Like, help me transfer this. Right. And so then I did that, and obviously, you know, I'm getting my two three percent interest. And then I, uh, I, then came kind of these other things like crypto. Uh, obviously, I, I, they see cash leave when I move my money into real estate, and that that's really no problem. They they understand that. Oh, you're buying real estate, great. But when I move money to crypto, it was the first thing, the, the same the same concept. Oh, are you sure th- 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 these are your money safe? Is, is it? Uh, um, r- it's very risky. This this is a scam. And I was like, well, that's okay. We'll see what happens. <laughs> She's like, oh, okay, like it's like, whatever. And then I started moving my money to stable coins, and I, like I'm not sitting here trying to like argue with them or fight them. I just want to like get my money transferred because right. I I have these issues of like, trying to wire things and do transfers online. It, it sucks I, I, for whatever reason. Like, I have an issue trying to do that. That's just why I'm actually trying to switch banks for a lot of stuff. But that's besides the point. So I go in and I moved a big chunk to stable coins, and this was a, a while ago now. But it was the same thing, like. Uh, this this is uh, seems very risky. Are, 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 have you done this before? Are you sure this account's not a scam? I'm like, well, you can just look at my account and you can see that I've I've transferred money multiple times just to make sure it was okay. She's like, well, are you, are you sure your money's gonna be there? It's like it's on the internet. You can't see it. I'm like, I can't see the money in your vault either. You guys right. are lending it out. <laughs> like like, what are you talking about? Do, do you, you know what I'm talking about? Like the fractional reserve lending system. I put a thousand dollars in there. You're gonna turn around and lend this thousand dollars to somebody else. The only reason why you can say that you have money is because you got FDIC up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. But it's like you don't have these reserves either. I understand how some of these things work. Is there risks? Absolutely. But I'm willing to learn how to mitigate these risks that way I can actually get a return on my money. So, you know, it's just one of those things where if you're not willing to change your mindset, you're gonna continue following the traditional mindset, right? Because like th- th- that is the average person's mindset. I, I don't want to move my money out of my bank because I, I, w- I don't know where it is. I don't know what's going to happen to it. And is there risks? Absolutely. Look, I, you're probably going to see some people lose money in crypto. I mean, you saw it happen with the squid coin. You're going to see more people lose money, especially if you start to see markets go down. If you see crypto prices go down, you're going to see more scams get exposed. You're going to see more crap get exposed. You're going to see more people lose everything. You saw it happen in every crash. I mean, look at the 2008 crash. When markets started to go down, what happened? All the Ponzi schemes started to show up because things went bust. And investments went bust. Toxic um, toxic assets went bust. And so when things go down, that's when the issues pop up, which is why instead of just trying to get allured to the the best and highest returns and the accounts that are going to pay you the most money and and the opportunities to 10x your money overnight look for the smarter investments and that that's that's what it's all about for me it's just like you know it's doing that research and knowing okay 
you know, what is it that I want to invest in? I know I want to own more real estate. And so I can just move the money out of stable coins and buy more real estate with it. And it's just like, you got to know the different ways that you can protect your money and grow your money. That way you are not just sitting there getting your value eaten away by inflation. And with that, is it time? It's time. It's time. It's time for the guac round where I answer your questions. Now, I'm just a random guy on YouTube. I am not a financial advisor, but if you want me, a random guy on YouTube, to answer your questions with my opinions, because they're only my opinions, nothing else. If you want me to answer your questions with my opinions, leave me a question using our voicemail app in the description below. All you got to do is call in. Leave me your name, say hello, and tell me where you're calling in from, and then ask me your personal financial questions, and then I will try to answer them here on the Guac Round. And with that, Nate, who is our first caller? Today's first caller is Boris. Hey, Jasper, this is B from sunny Florida. What's up, B? How you doing? Long-time listener, big fan of your content and thank the you. direction you're taking your channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My question, how do I invest for the long term when I also wholeheartedly believe in near-term systemic collapse? Mm. Should I be shorting <laughs> fisheries? Should I be going long on Coke? Bottle caps is currency. Or should I just cash <laughs> it all into gold, Bitcoin, and bullets like uh -huh. your friend Robert Kiyosaki? Yeah. <laughs> thank you and all the best to your team. Uh, thank you. Thank you, B. Good question. So wow. we kind of just discussed that pretty heavily. Uh, if you are worried, really worried about a, uh, a turn down, then yeah, gold, Bitcoin are, are your protectionary assets. I mean, like you said, uh, when I talked with Robert Kiyosaki, he invested money in gold, silver, Bitcoin, and bullets. That was his motto. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if, if you're worried, like, I mean, he's he's very worried about a downturn. He talks about how we're going to be going into a depression. So if, if that's what you're worried about, then you're right. You know, you, it's, it's your commodities, your physical commodities, things like Bitcoin, where it's, it's protectionary assets, because if that's what you believe, then you want to be able to have these protectionary assets so when things go down or if the dollar goes down, you can liquidate these assets that then go out by other things like real estate, maybe stocks, when you start to see that. So uh, the advantage of things like physical commodities like gold is even if the dollar doesn't crash, uh, your gold will hopefully maintain its value and then you can always sell that and then use that to buy assets as well. Next question is from Christopher. Good afternoon. My name is Chris. I'm located in Chicago, Illinois. Nice. What's up, Chris? Um, I had a question for you in regards to student loans. Okay. I owe about $50,000 in student loans. Uh -huh. and, uh, I've been investing for the past two to three, four years. Okay. And uh, I managed to make enough money in the stock market to pay off my loans. Wow. I believe wow. my total investments amount to 70 to 75,000. Wonderful. Nice so I was job. If I should sell my holdings shares to pay off my student loans 100% and be debt free or should Good I question. wait till I finish nursing school in yeah. 2 years, uh, become a nurse and just uh, aggressively pay off my loans. Wow. So the first thing I'd like to do after nice college job. is purchase an investment property where I could live in for at yep. least a year or two and uh, increase the size of the property every year. So at least I have like five to 10 units under my belt. Yes. So uh, here's... thank you. Please let me know what you think. Thank Bye. you, Chris. So good question. And Congrats, Chris, Chris. Yeah. Nice job. So the first thing is you got to know your risk because it's your student loans are, I don't know which student loans you have, but let's assume they're charging you 6% a year. If you pay those out early, you're getting a guaranteed 6% return on your money. Guaranteed, because now as soon as you pay that off, you don't got to pay 6% anymore. Now, if you leave your money in the market, it's the potential to see more upside, but it's also potentially seeing downside. So yeah, you can get better returns in the stock market. You can get better returns in real estate, but you can also lose money versus you get a guaranteed return when you pay down your student loans. And so, you know, you're young. You have the opportunity to see a lot of upside. You have, you have time on your side. So you can be riskier but you have to know how much risk you're willing to take. Personally, you know, I, I, I don't mind taking risk, but I would definitely take some of that cash and start paying down these student loans because that's going to be a big pain. And, you know, like we were talking about, if things slow down, and let's just assume bad things happen to your stock portfolio, you lose half of it, now you're going to be kicking yourself. Oh, man, I could have been done with these student loans, but I didn't because I was hoping that I would get richer. So don't get greedy. Take some of that money, pay down your student loans, and then you're free. Then you can take all of your money 
and invested all of your extra money. So don't get greedy, pay down some of those student loans, but keep investing for the long term because you got 75 in the market, 50 in student loans. Even if you paid off all your student loans, you still got 25 left. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So don't get greedy, pay down those student loans and use that extra cash to build wealth. Next up, we got a question from Andre. Hi, Jasper. This up? is Andre. Hi, Andre. Salsa. How you doing? Calling from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, Oh, I just Phoenix. wanted to ask you if you thought Shiba Inu was a long-term investment <laughs> or something that you should really be selling out of. Um, sure. It's mm. very volatile up and yeah. down like most of these altcoins. Yep. Um, yeah, so just wanted to get your thoughts on that as a long-term opportunity um, or something you should really be very cautious of. Look, Appreciate all you do. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That is more on your speculative side. Shiba Inu and these other smaller altcoins, meme coins, these are your speculative coins. These are not my long-term investments. I don't own any Shiba. Uh, so, you know, if, if you make a big profit, you got to start cashing out, in my opinion. You know, you don't want to just be sitting there holding this forever. Can Shiba Inu have more implications in the future? future? Sure, it has a lot of uses. But again, you know, anything that's speculative, if you see a huge run-up, start cashing out. If it goes down and you still believe in it, start buying more. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't invest in, in the meme coins. I don't like speculating like that. I like my safer investments. I, I, I don't like taking on that risk. But if you want to take some, have some fun with your money, fine. Invest your money into some of these speculative investments, fine. If you see huge returns, start cashing out. If you still believe in it, then you can buy back in. This one is from Jude. Hey, how you doing, Jesper? How you doing? My name is Jude, and I'm uh, from West Palm Beach, Florida. Nice to meet you. Thanks for calling in. A couple days ago, you released a video with. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki and you guys were doing an interview. And in the interview, Robert Kiyosaki referenced how he takes, uh, he borrows money from a property. So he'll yep. he'll get a property, it costs $1 million, yep. then the property increases to $10 million, then he'll borrow $5 million from the property. Right. My question is, how exactly does he do that? How do you physically do that? Sure, a good Thank question. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you answer my question. Thank you, Jude. Thank you for calling in. So, yeah, I did sit down with Robert a little while ago. We released a video on our YouTube channel a little while ago. And what he was talking about is how he uses debt. So he might buy a property for, let's assume, one billion, one million, And then uh, this doesn't mean he's going to buy it with a million dollars of cash. He's going to have some cash, some debt. Goes out and buys this property. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to increase the value of this property. So he might buy this property and do a bunch of renovations. He might you know, put in new kitchens, new bathrooms, give it a facelift so that it could be worth more. But more importantly, he wants to be able to raise the rents because we were talking about uh, investment property, the way that they're valued is by your rental income. So he buys a property for less than 1 million. He might put in another half a million or a million into it to really renovate it. And now he wants to be able to really charge higher rents. Now, when he charge higher rents, the property value goes up. And so if rents go up enough, he can hopefully value this property for, let's assume, $10 million, and he doesn't want to sell. That's what he was talking about, is he doesn't like selling because if he has $2 million into the property and he sold it for 10, now he has $8 million of taxable income. Now with real estate, you can defer those taxes with something called 1031, but what he's saying is instead of trying to pay taxes, what he can do is just refinance out. So pull out $5 million, through a mortgage, a refinance, pay off all of his costs. So he put $2 million in, take this $5 million out, pay off this $2 million that he put in. Now he's still left with $3 million and it's tax free because you don't pay debt. You don't pay taxes on debt that you take out. So now he has $3 million in his pocket. And because his property is valued much higher, he is now able to cover this debt service with the higher rents. So his rents are paying his expenses for the property. They're paying for his debt service. And he was able to put $3 million in his, prop in his pocket. Then now, if he wants to, we can use it to uh, go out and buy stuff or go out and buy another property to just keep, keep building up the cash flow to pay down this. And then he lives off of the cash flow that his investments pay him with. And with that, that's another Guac Talk in the books. This is Nate. If you want to see more of Nate, check out the Minority Mindset News channel where he posts videos every single day on the top finance and business news. These are amazing videos that will keep you up with everything going on in the world. So if you have not subscribed to and checked out the Minority Mindset News channel, you need to do that. This is Guaki. I am Just Preet Singh. And this was another episode of Guac Talk. Bitcoin has no actual value.
right? It's just a string of digital numbers that does nothing in the real world. I mean, you, you, you don't actually have any utility out of a Bitcoin, right? If, if, if you just have Bitcoin, you can have all 21 million of them and you can't do a thing with them.